Hi, I'm one of the armor smiths at James Fort. My name is Parker Brown. Have you ever been interested in knowing how we make some of the armor here at the museum? Well, stick around and find out. I base the helmet's design from the 17th century military manual, The Exercise of Arms, illustrated by Jacob de Guin in 1607. I start with a sheet of 1 16th inch thick low carbon steel sheet. Historically, armor smiths would have also used wrought iron. I trace the pattern onto the sheet with chalk and then cut them out using a cold chisel. Once the edges are filed clean, I can start rough dishing the helmet half into a shallow depression carved into a tree stump. As the work progresses, I must be mindful that both sides are worked to maintain the overall symmetry of the helmet. Shaping out each helmet half after rough dishing is accomplished through a process known as bouging. This is a long process where the piece is smoothed over a mushroom shaped stake into the rough final shape. It is a somewhat arduous task. This footage covers approximately one hour of work, but the efforts are worthwhile, especially if the results end with a well-shaped piece. Before progressing, I mark out and make a relief cut with a cold chisel to accommodate forming the helmet's central ridge. The line of the helmet crest is first drawn along the interior and then defined by hammering cold. Bringing the crest up from the body of the helmet will require heat delivered by the forge. For armor smithing work, charcoal was preferred as the fuel source. Unlike coal, charcoal was a manufactured product created by burning hardwoods in a low oxygen atmosphere. The trade responsible for the production of charcoal was known as a collier. I bring up the edge of the helmet to form the central crest. While it's tempting to rush, I need to slowly walk the edge up from the rest of the helmet, moving from one side to another. I focus on moving the metal at as even a rate as possible to limit the potential for warping or cracking. With the crest of the two halves shaped, the form of the helmet begins to be seen. Next, I draw a chalk line along the interior of the helmet so that it's perpendicular to the central line of the crest. I bring the brim up in the same manner as the crest, paying attention again so as to minimize warping and cracking. The two halves should now fit relatively snug into their positions, forming the whole of the helmet skull. I 
I draw circular guidelines from the apex of the helmet skull using a compass. A high polish is put to the faces of the hammers used for the next step. Following the drawn guidelines, the overall surface is smoothed out through a process known as planishing. The process takes a long time, but brings the two halves into their final shape and symmetry. This is crucial for later polishing. In preparation for finishing, I affix each helmet half to an adjustable wooden board. And the process of smoothing is begun with a rough bastard file. Smoothing with a file continues from the rough bastard file through to a fine milling file. Uneven areas revealed during filing are planished out and then filed smooth. Once all the surface has been filed smooth, it's time to begin polishing. Armor smiths by the 17th century were capable of achieving an astonishingly high polish. By the time of the Jamestown expedition, the process was almost industrial in scale. James Fort would not have had access to such polishing mills, so I will use an older and simpler method of polishing. It consists of the application of linseed oil to a leather-stropped polishing stick. Abrasive pumice powder is applied to the oiled leather. And the stick is used like a file to essentially sand down the surface. As the process continues, I can apply the abrasive media with an oil-soaked cloth. The abrasive media used goes from a rough to a fine pumice, followed by Tripoli, decayed limestone. And finally, Jeweler's Rouge, which is a form of refined iron oxide. With the two halves polished, I can turn my attention to rolling the edges of the brim. I will roll each brim half individually over a section of 1 16th inch diameter steel wire. Rolling the edge over a section of wire gives needed rigidity to a vulnerable point on the armor and helps to hold the shape of the helmet when struck. 17th century European armor smiths tended to roll towards the interior of the piece and then chase a line from the front, popping out the roll. This could often be embellished with roping work, but the Deguin example is plain, so I will stick with that. With the two halves of the helmet skull complete, I will now focus on the articulated cheek pieces. The cheek pieces are cut from 18 gauge thick sheet steel using a cold chisel. I file the edges of the plate clean and give each a slight bevel. The center rivet hole for each plate is drilled with an early version of the bracing bit based on a similar example from the 16th century English ship the Mary Road. The 1 8 inch diameter drill bit is an older spade bit design which is capable of cutting whether the drill is turned clockwise or counterclockwise. 
Two tabs of eight ounce vegetable tanned cow leather are cut and pierced to form the backing of the cheek pieces. I rivet the plates onto the tab with one eighth inch diameter brass rivets or arming nails. The backs are riveted through cut steel washers so the rivet doesn't tear through the leather. And I sew an interior linen liner onto the back to help ensure comfort to the wearer. With the cheek pieces complete, I'm now in the final stages of finishing the helmet. German armorsmiths had already developed threaded bolts and screws by the late 15th century. These simple fasteners were used not only to hold finished armor together, but could also be used as temporary connections during the construction and assembly process. While standardized threading would not be developed until the 19th century, 17th century armorsmithing shops would have had their own threading standards to match with their own shop-made fasteners. The required holes are drilled out to their final diameter and held fast with slotted bolts and square nuts using a simple screwdriver or turn screw. Once joined, the crest is marked out, chiseled, and filed into the characteristic shark fin design that distinguishes this type of cabasset. The positions of the cheek pieces are marked out, drilled, and temporarily attached with bolts. The front edge of the helmet crest is rolled and crimped over to both reinforce the crest and join the two halves together. Now all that remains is to remove each bolt one by one and replace it with a hammered rivet. A brass plume holder is fabricated and installed at the back of the helmet. The use of plumes isn't entirely understood, but likely helped with unit identification in battle. Preformed brass rivets, arming nails, are used to attach the cheek pieces to the sides of the helmet. Riveting is done through square washers. cheek pieces installed, it's time to address the interior liner. The liner first requires a perforated leather strip to be installed at the base of the helmet's skull. And then the liner itself is whip-stitched into the perforations in the leather strip. The helmet is now finished and ready to be issued to an English soldier. The finished helmet weighs about four pounds, eight ounces, and it took about 82 hours of work for approximately two weeks. However, as you can see, the results are pretty spectacular. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation on the creation of this helmet. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that notification bell for more on the history of James Fort. Expecting instantaneous results, you're going to be very, very, very disappointed.